Welcome to the 13985 Black History Everyday podcast series. I am Timothy Maurice, your behavior psychology author and global learning director for the MBDA Federal Procurement Center. And I'm delighted to be joined by co-host Keith Moore, who is the operator of that same center, as well as CEO of KDM and Associates. And we are delighted to be joined by Charlie Forston. Charlie, welcome to 13985 Black History Everyday. How are you? Thank you. I'm well. How are you? Are you okay if we call it Charlie versus Charlie? I, I prefer it. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. It was we got a chance to sit down and chat, and I heard your passion for, you know, this movement back in DC last year. And so we want to pick up on that conversation. Keith, I'm gonna hand it over to you to really set the stage for the extraordinary work she's doing and what we are doing together. Thanks, Tim and Charlie. Um, I am so proud of you for the work that you're doing as an operator in a very historic location. Um, that that my our, our undersecretary comes from, right? State of Louisiana. Yeah. Um, and um, what this conversation is about relative to bridging the gap between MBEs being able to um, transform the future by honoring the past and doing so every day. So as a new operator, welcome to the MBDA Center conversation and welcome to this podcast. Um, I'd love to start off by asking you, <clears throat> you know, how do you feel Black History Month, you as an operator, where you're managing the center and the history of where that community comes from, the university that you're in and the HBCU, how it all comes together in your mind during this Black History Month celebration, thinking about 13985. Right. So, you know, considering that, you know, executive order and the the fact that, you know, its purpose is to really, you know, bring about equality, um, you know, especially amongst the African American, well, underserved community, but, you know, especially African American community. And I think that, you know, where uh, the Louisiana MBDA Business Center is located um, on Southern University's campus, we're, op we're operated by Southern University Law Center. Um, you know, when you consider the history of Southern University Law Center, you know, we were started because, you know, uh, Charles Hadfield was denied except or um, admission into LSU's Law Center. And as a result, they started the Southern University Law Center. Um, so we, we, we were started, you know, because of, you know, discriminatory practices that were permissible in this state. Um, moving that even further, um, when you consider, um, you know, just some of the things that we've been able to do, you know, being in the Baton Rouge area, um, you know, for this community, you know, it, it's, it's a historic uh, landmark in and of itself, right? Um, and so when you're considering the, you know, Black History Month and what we, you know, what we're able to do for the minority, you know, business community, um, you know, it, it's just a continuation of a legacy that, you know, that was started, you know, er, in the early 1900s, you know. Mm -hmm. So we're we're excited to, to be here. We're excited to be operated by the Law Center um, because, you know, as we know that when it comes to businesses, you know, or businesses getting started, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, new businesses need, you know, and legal services is definitely one of them. And, you know, through mm -hmm. with the law center, you know, in addition to the MBDA center that that is, you know, operated by them, you know, we also have other clinics. So we provide clinical services to the minority community. So, you know, things from, you know, um, um, you know, family assistance. So, you know, getting a divorce, but, you know, still it's needed, right? Uh, we do a lot of work in the community around heirs property. So we know that that's a, mm -hmm. that's a, um, that's something that you can do when you're thinking about creating generational wealth. A lot of the times, you know, uh, our baby boomers pass away and they've not had any type of will or succession plan in place. And that property just sits there, you know, um, accruing taxes, you know, no real established ownership. And, you know, and it also is, uh, you know, detrimental to, to commerce, you know, in that particular community, which happens mm -hmm. to be 
you know, predominantly minority communities. So we do a lot of work around heirs properties where our students, um, you know, are helping to, you know, create wills, doing, you know, title searches, trying to identify, you know, who is the, the owner in place. We also have mm -hmm. a, a, a tech and entrepreneurship clinic that is, um, you know, supported by the USPTO office. So we, you know, help uh, new businesses that, you know, um, that need trademark and patent assistance, copyright assistance. Yeah. Um, so our, our law center is really, you know, well positioned to help the minority community in so many aspects that, you know, extend beyond businesses, but are still, you know, tangential to, you know, businesses uh, needs as well as creating generational wealth. Um, and so we, we, we we think that this is a really good partnership um, with the law center being able to, you know, uh, manage the MBDA center. Wow. Yeah, Tim, I, I see you smile there a bit, and I can't help but think you're thinking a little bit like uh, maybe I am around of the book, uh, Long Walk to Freedom in Madiba. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Literally, literally what he was all about, right? Everything she said. And, uh, Tim and I, uh, Tim being in South Africa, and I, since I guess back in 2003 to five, spent a, a lot of time in Africa with Tim, you know, with the Mandela family and and everything around Africa uh, and where we've come to with the internet of things. You know, I think about an article that we wrote says, uh, what would Martin Luther King do with the internet? You know, um, so you've come a long way. We've all come a long way uh, to a point in time such as this. So um, uh, it's exciting. But now we have this public policy that's mandating acquisition equity uh, mm -hmm. in the federal government across the board, which is yet another exercise in transformational, uh, you know, evolving agency to agency culture. Uh, process, uh, how we think about uh, equity and its importance to national security. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, Tim, what's your thinking? What's your question? Well, I think, I think regionally, your voice is unique. You know, if you think about the soul of business, one of the greatest talks I've heard in a long time is around you know, we are different as people of color. When I think of Black history, I don't think just of the struggle. I think of the soul, you know, the the almost like there's a there's the underbelly of romance. And I think that, you know, you've been based in New Orleans. You think of the 1.3 billion Black people there are in the world, the billion or so in, in Africa, the 47 million, however many million in America, and a couple million in the Caribbean. You're in a region that really matters mm -hmm. to to the soul of the diaspora. And so as we think about moving forward and you think about your role and the role that your center plays, you know, I'd like to think of it as you bringing the technical, the spiritual and the soul of business. And this is where the magic comes in. And I think there's no person better to bring that than you. I mean, I remember when we met, it was clear to me that you had that left brain, right brain balance. You had the technical, like legal, serious, structured side of your brain, but you also have a soul, a romance to how you see this thing. And I, I want you to just quickly comment on, you know, when you look five, 10 years down the line, you know, what role do you see your center playing in, you know, promoting the diaspora, not just your region, but being able to impact the diaspora, knowing that that region means so much to the diaspora. Sure. So, you know, I think there are um, a lot of things that we see. So, for instance, on, on this side of things, you know, we've got a lot of MBEs that sign up for services, and there's a huge um you know, learning gap, if you will, or knowledge gap, I won't say learning gap, a knowledge gap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so, you know, a lot of the times, you know, they think they're ready, and they're not really ready. 
you know, um, and when you try to give them the programs, you know, that would get them ready, they aren't necessarily always participating because they think they're already ready. But, yes. um, but I will say that, you know, we are, so one of the things that we're doing in terms of, you know, just kind of getting more businesses involved in the procurement space, you know, overall is that, um, you know, we're, we're launching, you know, the first week of March, you know, this federal procurement readiness program. And so oh, wow. training businesses on what they need in order to participate in that federal procurement space. So, you know, and just in, you know, sending out the communication and starting the, registra the, the registration process, to, you know, to my surprise, we've already had a, you know, a, a, you know, real positive feedback in terms of the number of people who registered and just, you know, within hours of, of the registration link is now live. Um, I think the other thing, though, is last summer, um, I actually traveled to Ghana, and I had an opportunity to, you know, meet with, uh, you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce there, and, you know, a lot of, you know, businesses that are, that are you know, innovators and in, in startups, and, um, and even, uh, you know, businesses that are in those commodity type, you know, uh, goods and goods type businesses, and, you know, one of the things that that struck me as as odd, maybe not so so odd, but at least interesting, is that you know even when we considered that you know uh, the the U.S. being this world leader and Ghana not there yet, right? That there's still a lot of the same issues and challenges that businesses here face much like the businesses in Ghana. And you would think that with the economies being being much different and with policies being much different, that you would have different struggles. And it's and that's not the case. It's the, the struggle was the same. And when you listen to, we had, uh, you know, we had a lot of different, you know, um, open sessions where we, we spoke candidly, you know, about the challenges that, you know, the Ghanaian businesses face. And it was just really startling to see that it was just that it was just almost identical. And you would just kind of expect us, you know, to be a little bit further ahead because our economy is further ahead. But that wasn't really the case. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we have coming up is uh, in May, we're doing a, a business and procurement conference um, here in Baton Rouge. And we've got, you know, some of our federal partners who will be there. We'll be doing, you know, the technical assistance there. We'll have matchmaking events happening. But we've invited those Ghanaian businesses to come over. And, you know, and they are excited. I don't know how many will actually register and show up, but I will say that, you know, we've communicated that to the Chamber of Commerce and we, you know, and what we're hoping is that in their, in them coming, that we'll be able to foster relationships from MBEs here to, you know, with MBEs, uh, you know, out of Ghana. And that's something that they're at, that they're really looking forward to doing. So we're hoping to, you know, have that meet up for them so that they can, you know, establish those relationships and begin to do business with each other across the water. Part of our mission, Charlie, is to ensure that this entire ecosystem thrives when our partners, such as Cynthia Griffin at the U.S. Department of Commerce and the her role as missionary in the sub-Saharan region, they must know that you're doing this work. Mm. The work that you're doing with Ghana to advance what's happening in the diaspora, the reason why we are compiling these conversations, because we want the leading voices that are passionate about driving diaspora to be known, to be recognized, and to be at the forefront of these conversations. Whether it's ITA or any of our partners that are in this mission, the foundation has been led, has been laid, and we are prepared to lead that as the Federal Procurement Center and KDM and Associates. We want to thank you for your continued commitment. I'd like to do part two with okay. you at some point. Once you do this work, let's come back on. Let's bring some of our other leaders together on this same conversation. Maybe in Women's Month, we'll have you back on to get some. I've been chatting to some of our colleagues about at the Chamber of Commerce across Africa about bringing leading women together. Maybe we'll have you back on, but thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. Right. Thank yes. you to everyone. Please share these episodes to someone who cares about the diaspora and the, the well-being of MBEs in America as we all continue to evolve and grow. Until next time.
Thank you so much. Thank you.